Good afternoon. It is an immense pleasure to be here today for what is our ninth TL talk. We started this in April without any big ambition. Uh, the goal was just to send out some positive energy. And I am so grateful to say that to date, we have had over 18,000 people join our conversation. So I wanted to thank everybody that's listened to us. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of your journey, for logging in and sharing a few moments of your day with us. Uh, I hope that we have been able to spread some light and uh, make your day, your week, your month a little bit easier and lighter. Um, I want to introduce myself. For those that don't know me, my name is Tina Lira. I am the founder and owner of uh, TL Portfolio, which is a communication and representation company with seven offices throughout uh, North and South America. And we have an amazing team of 17 uh, women. I am a mixture of many cultures and I have always been attracted to diversity. I see it as a gold mine of meeting new people and opening your mind and learning. And so it's always been a, a subject and something that I've, I've had great passion for. I left Brazil when I was 10 and I spent 21 years traveling and living abroad, including growing up in Mexico, Switzerland, Paris, living with seven tribes in Southeast Asia. I was living in New York during 9-11. I lived in Singapore during SARS. I lived in Turks and Caicos during the Hurricane Francis. Um, and I really struggled with the idea of going back to Brazil after 21 years, because I, I was scared that it was gonna take away this, this ability to learn from such a diverse experience of living abroad. And little did I know that if you're willing to listen and you're willing to keep your mind open, uh, there is learning and of diversity everywhere. Uh, so today's panel is about a subject that's very dear to me, the subject of diversity. It's one that the more I learn, the more I have empathy and the more I realize the complexity of the subject. It's a delicate subject that we're embarking on. And I realize, and I'm very cautious because despite the best intentions, I know and that I may stumble upon some words or I may offend some people or the conversation may do so. But I think our intention is only to learn, to bring matters uh, in an open manner, and most importantly, to hopefully make today a mark so that tomorrow we start a movement for change. I think uh, we must overcome the fear of addressing of diversity. And I say that because it's one that I felt tremendous fear. And I thank all my panelists. I thank all my guests that are joining me today for teaching me, for embracing the subject, for supporting us to come out openly and talk about it, despite not being experts in the subject and really being here to learn. Today, it's also important to mention that today marks a very important holiday in the United States, Juneteenth Day, June 19th, 1865. Uh, the day slaves were freed from the United States, but it's also a date that's celebrated across the whole world as the end of slavery, but to celebrate the culture and the achievements of African-Americans. Today, there is an important movement happening in the United States, the Black Lives Matter, which is essential. And I hope that we will finally put an end to the cruelty and brutality, which, has, which us united as human beings can no longer be allowed. It's important to mention that today is an important day also for the Asians. On this day, Vincent Chen, a Chinese American draftsman was beaten to death by two white men in, uh, in the US. Um, it was a very unfortunate incident because it came from the resentment of unemployment in the auto industry and out of anger towards the uh, automobile industry and specifically towards the Japanese. Vincent was Chinese. And so it's important to realize that racism and not only racism, but everything that the challenges that live within this group of diversity, um, we're not intending to undermine one, but to embrace all of them and to hopefully change and improve our industry, starting with our industry and hopefully beyond uh, from this day forward. As such, I think it's important that I frame what we intend to discuss here today without undermining any member of this diverse community. We are here to speak to a global audience in the hope, in the hope of evoking change. We are addressing the topic of diversity as a whole. Uh, sorry, we're addressing the topic of diversity as a whole in order to ensure we make a difference as we 
look to tomorrow. The first step to reaching change is to realizing you don't want to, you no longer want to be where you stand today. And I think that I will never be accused as a woman of staying silent, but I'm okay with that. And with that, I thank again the panelists. I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody that's here today. Um, and I thank you for the courage of joining us and for the willingness to share and learn. So thank you. And I'm going to start with our dear friend, Nancy Novograd, founder of Culti Culturati Travel Design. Nancy was editor in chief of Travel and Leisure magazine for two decades, taking over the role in 1993, overseeing the magazines that sent to the top US and global travel publication in circulation, um, introducing five international editions as well as Travel and Leisure's powerful online presence. In recognition for her achievements, at Travel and Leisure, Nancy was inducted into the U.S. Travel Association Hall of Leaders in November 2019, the first editor to be, at, to be accorded uh, this honor. I think, Nancy, we have shared a number of friends, and I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you so much for making time to share our wisdom um, and to be in this important panel. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have another dear person, uh, Ted Tang, was a former CEO of Leading Hotels of the World. Uh, a post which she held for a decade. Prior to joining leading hotels of the world, Ted led the growth of some of the world's most predominant leading hotel brands. And he was president and chair, chief operating officer of Wyndham International, uh, president of Asia Pacific's for Starwood and the accolades go on. Ted, you're a legend in our industry. Uh, you're full of wisdom. And I thank you so much for being here to share all your wisdom with us. Thank you. I look forward to your contribution. Um, a new friend that I have to thank, uh, Jean-Luc Naré, and who I'm looking forward to staying very close to um, because I'm already, I'm so in admiration of everything you do, Alexandra Chamla. Alexandra is the president and founder of Altour, uh, one of the largest travel management companies, both in the United States and globally, founded in 1991. Prior to founding Altour, Alexandra served as a consultant in various airline and hotel companies. Um, he is a member of the French American Chamber of Commerce, um, he, he has been also awarded the French Tourism Office Gold Medal on Tourism. He was a co-founder of the Hampton Film Festivals. I mean, the accolades go on and on. And so thank you so much for making time. Your example uh, of, of what I hope the industry will catch on through your achievements in your university, which I know you're going to talk about. And so I know we're all busy and I value very much you taking the time to be here today. A dear friend that I have been able to get to know better over the years and who I value every moment that I can spend uh, with Jean-Luc Naré. Jean-Luc Naré is CEO of JLN & Co, a boutique company specialized in the development and developing ideas for the luxury market. Uh, he was the former CEO of La Reserve Hotels and Spas. Uh, he was also general manager of uh, one and only Richie Ra, the residence Mauritius, and managing, managing director of Heritage Resorts to name a few. Between 2004 to 2011, he was the director of the Michelin Guide, achieving incredible, incredible uh, accolades along the way. Um, he is talking to us from beautiful uh, Saint-Tropez. So thank you, Jean-Luc, uh, for joining us, always knowing how to enjoy life to the maximum. So thank you for being here. Another uh, very dear friend that I have known for a few years now, uh, Danilo Siqueira. Danilo is uh, CEO of Tempo VP, which is a boutique DMC specialized in luxury segment, a benchmark already within the Mexican and South American markets, and soon a benchmark in North America as well. Um, Danilo was born in Brazil, uh, but he chose Portugal as, as his home. In 2004, he founded his own company, uh, Tempo VP, and he's going to share with us a lot about his stories, tips, recommendations, and what you'll enjoy is this amazing passion, incredible energy, which is always so nice to be close to. So Danilo, thank you for joining us from Portugal as well. We've brought in uh, five very special guests, uh, which I'm honored to have on the panel as well. Um, and I'm gonna be introducing them as they're gonna be asking a few of the questions and, and voicing you know, what their concerns, uh, their inquiries are from different sides of the hotel industry as well as the travel trade. So Brianna, Janelle, Chris, here, Eric, thank you for being with us. I'm going to give you individual introductions when we get to your, to your questions so that I can get on with our talk. Otherwise, they'll be listening to me no end. So I want to pass on the mic to uh, 
Keir Matthews, who's the director of sales of Classic Custom Vacations, which is a, an Expedia company. Um, he has enjoyed a fantastic career, including VP of sales at Europe Express, manager at Virtuoso, a uh, passage through Cruise West. Yet, I love the fact that his greatest achievement is being the father of Isabella, who's 15, and Giovanni, who's 26. He is joining us from the golf course, and we're very honored to have him posing a question. Then he has to get back to his game. So thank you, Kier. It's an honor to have you, and thank you so much for breaking the game. I hope we're going to help with your swing. I, I hope so, too. And listen, here's going to be a secret for everybody on this call. As, the, as a black man, it's Juneteenth Day, and I'm on a golf course at a country club. So let's not let everybody know that this is how I'm celebrating Juneteenth Day. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm going to get back to the game, but I'm also <laughs> going to get back to celebrating with my daughter. Hey, listen, here's the bottom line for me, and here's the thought that has stuck out for me. For years, people of color have been having a conversation around diversity and inclusion uh, in this industry. And most of those conversations have occurred most likely and more often in private. And what we, what I want to pose or a thought that I want to leave, start this with is I want to make sure that for the panelists that as we look at two months, four months, eight months, a year, 24 months, what are we doing with all the learnings from calls like this and conversations with our friends? Because at the end of the day, we know that the industry is going to take a little while to turn around. Some of us are a little more optimistic than others. Um, but once we start to turn around, how can we start taking all these great ideas and things we've learned and applying them? Because I don't think, you know, when it comes to inclusion and diversity, this topic is going to go away uh, anytime soon. So thank you all for having me. I'm super excited and glad I could be here. And uh, I'm also glad I found a spot with some good signal uh, on the course for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kier. And I think that you bring in a very important topic. The idea is that this conversation does not stop here. We want this panel to be uh, a launching board and a start. And so it is an invitation to everybody that's on the panel, all of our guests and those that are listening to us. If you wanna be part of this conversation going forward, I invite you to be part of our newly formed today committee um, of the topic of diversity. And we wanna keep it going. And on my side, I commit to possibly every two months bringing the topic back. And I think that if every we keep bringing this topic back to, to our TL talks, we can look back and think, what have we achieved in these two months? You know, what, would it, what have we done with all these suggestions and recommendations? So let this be the start of something new. Let this be the start of where we join forces and we learn from the best and uh, we start a new tomorrow. So it's very exciting. And with that, I wanted to start by asking um, Alexandra Chemla, You've had incredible success um, with All Tour. And I think there is a story that I want to be told and I want people to hear about that it's your internship program, your university. And the reason why I say it's so successful is because, you know, we talk about recruitment and we're going to address recruitment here, but you have been able to create a platform, a uh, university or an internship program, where through your actions throughout the years, you have intentionally or unintentionally, but you have genuinely, most importantly, welcome every member of the diverse community. Uh, and so most recently with your newest group in your internship, you've had 40% of that group belong to the, to the uh, black community, which is phenomenal. It's incredible because uh, you didn't do it uh, by going to any special you know, university or anything. You did it because you have an open communication and they felt welcome. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. You know, I, uh, my background has been uh, before I started at two, 10 years at Club Med. So talking about diversification, uh, this is a place where um, diversification was part of life. Uh, so when I started Alto, um, this was one of the major goal um, that I wanted to create within the company um, is to create a big family without, um, without any difference of uh, race or religion. And, uh, and, and also what we needed in this industry of travel was to have, you know, more uh, new blood. And that's how the idea of create, uh, creating this university has come up. Um, and it was started, I mean, it was created in 2016 and, uh, and we had our first university and when we realized in fact that all this 
you know, kids that we took from different school who had interest, you know, travel um, has been uh, so interested to join. So when, when we had them in a forum, then we have realized, you know, how important it was to have new blood in our industry. In fact, um, one of our, uh, one of our students uh, four years ago uh, was a, he was a great student because he went from 2016 being a student to today being a manager of, of a department. Um, he's a Latino. And, and again, you know, what's difficult for me is to talk about diversification because this was in our blood. This is in our lives. This is how this company has been created. And this is what we have. So we, we, you know, we never made any difference and we always welcome everyone with open arm and, and everyone is part of this huge family. It's very easy to talk about family. Uh, too many people use it for the wrong word. It's difficult to act on it. And we are a real family without any diversification of any, like I said, race or religion. And, and you know, and, and that's what I love about, about the companies that I've created because I'm the guardian of this rule and I will make sure that this rule uh, will never change. Of course, if tomorrow the board decide to fire me, it be a different story. But uh, but as far as I know, and as long as I am here, I will I will continue to be there. I you know, it's it's something so exciting to to have all these young people uh, from all the world, all these different parts who want to learn every day and who want to be part of of something, they want to be part of an adventure. And, and, and that's basically what we are offering. And, and the beauty of it is having, in fact, all this education within the company. I don't know if I, I answer your question. If I did you not, did. I can add no, more. No, 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 you, you did. And I think that what you say is evident when these communities come to your door. And that's, I think, one of the things that's so important because one of the things I've been hearing from different, um, you know, the black community and, and different communities is, you know, we don't feel welcome. And so, you know, if you don't get the CV it's because you haven't made it clear that we're welcome. And I, and I think if you're getting those CVs and you're getting such a large percentage, um, then it's because you're making that welcoming message of yours and this family approach noticed and heard. And so that's, that's fantastic. I think that's something to, that we can all learn from. And that's the idea of, about this committee that we wanna form is to say, okay, how did you do it? And how can we multiply that to other companies? You know, how did you get that message? What's, was it, is it a detail in the communication? Is it, how, how do we copy that and multiply it, right? And so that's something that I'd love to follow up with you later um, as, we, as we work on this message going forward. Um, I wanted to uh, invite uh, Janelle. Uh, Janelle is a luxury travel advisor. Uh, she is the owner of Lilax and Chai, which is an affiliate avant-garde travel virtuoso agency, uh, or originally from a small town in southwestern Michigan. Her father is from Rwanda, her mother of Swedish lineage. Uh, she's been a hotelier for 12 years and is now a tra luxury travel advisor. So Janelle, thank you for being here. Um, I think you have an important question uh, to, to Nancy, so you have the mic. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Tina, and for everyone for um, taking on this important challenge and conversation uh, in the industry and in the world. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to share, it's it's kind of some, some of these facts have been going on online uh, recently, but I'm citing it from the Black Travel Alliance. Um, so according to a 2018 report from the Mandala Research, um, Black Americans alone spend 63 billion, and that's a B with a B, <laughs> not an M, a B, <laughs> 63 billion on travel each year. Yet there is little to no Black representation in the management and staff of larger travel companies. So similarly, there is a major lack in Black representation in press trips, marketing campaigns, um, even from some of the cities and countries that do attract a large number of Black people um, or have a large number of Black people themselves. So my question 
to the group and to Nancy specifically, um, but can open it up is, you know, how do we bridge uh, this gap in favor of more diversity in travel and also in media? I, first of all, I think that we've lost some of our blindness to it, that a very good thing about what has occurred in recent times is that people are much more sensitive to these disparities. And I think pretty much across the board, working hard to, to set right something that has been very wrong for so many years. Um, I spoke with Jackie Gifford, the editor in chief of Travel and Leisure this morning. And um, I, I about a number of things, including uh, featuring more, more black people of color in the magazine, which I recall from my time was something we, we, would, we were sensitive to, but not to the greatest extent. I mean, we loved it if a photographer came back with diverse images of diverse people because that connoted a certain mod modernity to us even then. But I think it's much more of an effort now um, and much more of an effort, Jackie said, to hire black photographers be, and to send them to places like Paris because the perspective might be somewhat different or at least the, you know, the, ability to explore and, and find things that might not be as perceptible. I think, you know, there are many problems. There are problems in uh, opportunities in hotel companies. I, I'm always, uh, when I think about it, surprised that I don't see more of affluent Black in five, at five-star resorts. And I know I've heard from other people that there are issues in some cultures with, you know, welcoming, lack of welcoming to, to uh, people of, with dark skin who are affluent travelers. And, and then there are the hotels and, uh, and tourism companies that are not, have not brought up enough people. And I think that's, I think that everyone's pretty much alerted now. And I don't think that that, that will continue. One of the goals, there has to be some kind of benchmarking. And, you know, there has been a government standards for diversity in companies, but there we all have to do a much better job to measure progress and to, to bring about change, uh, you know. And Janelle, what are you seeing? Um, yeah, I think those are really great points. And I, I think the first point uh, that we've acknowledged, everyone has kind of brought to light is that you have to acknowledge that there is an issue and that maybe the lack of, re of representation just hasn't been thought of in the past. But um, having started my agency a couple years ago, it was like, you know, where do I find pictures of people that look like me or like some of my clients um, represented in the travel industry? And it was difficult to find. So it was finding other companies like Munaluchi Bridal, which is a multicultural luxury high-end bridal community that has photographers and wedding planners and florists, everything you could want um, from a multicultural perspective. Also Travel Noir or Blavity on the tech side and all of those different sources were able to provide this robust, um, I would say, just a portfolio of amazing images. And what I would challenge um, everyone is to reach out to some of those people and to those content creators to be able to um, supplement. And, you know, they have really great imagery and, and really great resources and real life experience. Um, that they can contribute. So I think that it's collaboration. Um, but at first, the first thing you said is acknowledging that there is an issue and then acting on it. So it has to be more so more of just not so much just it's something that happened and nothing changes. This time has to be a little bit different. 
and and I'm sure it will. And I have to, to officially thank Janelle because um, we had a little conversation before. And I, I have to say, I've always thought of myself as a very open-minded, I love diversity. You know, I've been exposed to different cultures my whole life. And I think that I was pretty open-minded and pretty aware of the subject. And when we talked uh, before, um, before the panel when I made the invitation and she was talking about stock imaging. And I thought, I thought, oh, you're right. You know, I, and it's funny. I was like, you're, this is terrible. I haven't seen it. And one of the things you talked that really got to me was, you know, there are not a lot of people from the black community in the luxury travel because they don't feel welcome. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I, why not? And she said, you know, did you ever think about that? If you're a child and you've never seen a photo of yourself in any publication in the luxury travel, what are we telling them? You know, we're telling them they're not welcome because they can't see themselves there. And I felt like a punch in the stomach, you know, I was like, oh, that's terrible. I can't believe we're doing that. But it's, yeah. it was like an aha moment for me, you know, and I called Nancy and I'm like, Nancy, imagine what we're doing to these children, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know? So it, right. it's the learning, it's the opening our eyes. It's about, there's no way tomorrow is gonna be the same for anybody that's listening to this because, and it wasn't out of malice. It was just out of, I didn't see it, you know, because, and of course, growing up and seeing myself and I, 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 everything is open to me. And it's, and yet when you put briefly step inside your, another point of view, it's like, oh my goodness. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for opening my eyes. Um, I, 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 I'm very grateful. Um, the, the next question is uh, for Ted Tang. Um, Eric Floyd is a director of luxury sales at Accor North America. And um, he's also had an incredible career. Uh, he's been, uh, I know he's been a very um, favorite panelist at Proud. I think, you know, people recognize you and they, you have a huge uh, fan club. So thank you for being here. Um, and you have a, a comment that has a lot to do also with senior leadership um, that you've seen throughout your career lacking diversity and so you have a very important question that you want to pose to ted so please the stage is yours first of all thank you so much tina for having me and thank you fellow panelists for your input and i you know it's great being here um my question as you said it revolves around diversity and inclusion um in the executive level um over 20 years i've worked in the hospitality industries for some great hotel companies and you know being a black male going into these boardrooms, I came to realize that I was probably in most cases the only person of color in one of these meetings. So um, on the executive side of things, um, um, my, my question to Ted is, you know, with your experience um, leading hotels of the world and various companies you've worked for, what is being done or what steps can we take to you know, promote people of color in the executive boardrooms and the executive teams and advisory boards as well? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to you unmute. off. There you go. We'll You're, to good. You're good. You're good. Not a talking You're already. Um, thank you, Eric. You, I, I, I agree with you. Um, in 2003, or thereabouts, you know, AHLA, and this is American context, AHLA's lodging magazine had a cover story on the hotel brands and the brand leaders in the U.S. 64 headshots across the cover, right? Not one single black, not one single Latino, Latina not one single Native American that I can see, two Asian Americans, I was one of them. The trouble is, I don't think that picture is that different today. Now, in my career, I had to deal with many different, let's just call it imbalances, okay? When I ran Star with Asia Pacific, it was the privileged expats versus the under-recognized local managers. At Wyndham International, which was a real estate owning company and not the franchising company today, uh, I think Wyndham Worldwide now, they made good progress with gender equality, but not on racial equality. At Leading Hotels, which is a global company, I dealt with more a, a lack of global diversity. Um, not only was it a US centric company, it was a New York City centric company when we're operating around the world. But to, to address your question, really, let me, let me address it through the lenses of Wyndham International. Right? As I said, Wyndham made good progress with women in executive roles in legal, finance, sales, HR, 
in real estate development, but not in ops, not in operations. Operations, it was all white male. Now, they're all good people, okay? When I got there in 2000, they're all good people, but there are other good people too, right? And, and here, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, um, a little glimpse of what that issue is. When a senior vice president of operations, you know, the next level down from me, I was a president chief operating officer. When an SVP of ops will recommend someone for a general manager's position of a hotel, I would often hear, oh, he's a good guy. I come to learn that a good guy means he's just like me. I understand that, you no? Know? I too am drawn to the younger Ted Tings out there, right? But that approach produces sameness, okay? So, I mean, I, I, I feel like if I look at people, they are, they are racist, right? They're, they're clearly negative racist. They are non-racist, they're neutral. And then there's anti-racist, anti-racist, offsets the negative work of racists, right? They, they, they prevent things from getting worse, but that still means it is still status quo. And then there are the active includers. These are people who reach out and bring in people that's not like them and in order to bring a broader perspective to, to the company, right? And they are the ones who make progress, but there's not enough of them. When, when, it, when it comes to diversity, right, businesses that I see in my experience in the US, they fall into three categories. One, on, on, on the issue of diversity, right? One is let's play defense. Let's not look bad, right? Let's avoid boycotts and scandals, oh my goodness. The whole mission of that is let's protect our current markets and current customers. Let's not let these things distract us. We're not bad people. And then the second type is, hey, green is everybody's color. And they see market expansion into minority markets, into underserved markets, acquiring new customers, right? They may even develop new products for them. It's an economic motive, right? What's wrong with that? Nothing until, until if the economics dries up. And then, there's, and then there's one that is sees diversity and inclusion as a strategic advantage. It sees that we have people from different perspectives, from different backgrounds, different life experiences. It gives us broader perspective. It makes us more creative, more innovative, and, and people know we are a good company to do business with because we care about people. You know, our employees are more fulfilled and more productive and we get to retain more of them. We have happier employees, we have better service and happier customers. So, you know, um, you make I, a very I, good I wish I can tell you there's, a, there's an easy solution, um, but, but there, there, there isn't. It's, 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 it's about choosing where do we want to be on that spectrum uh, as, to, as to when we run our business. And, and I thank you for that insight. I think I um, empathize a lot with those scenarios. Um, and, and I personally can tell you, it's, uh, it was a scary moment to come out and put this panel together. You know, there was criticism even before I put it together, even though the, the you know, the intention is good, uh, but it does rock the boat and it does bring out a, a, a difficult subject. And as you said, it's easier not to rock and just continue to serve and, and kind of just say, you know what, I'm colorblind. I, I like everybody. Let's just get back to business, you know, but th th the problem is bigger than that. And I think that this is, and I hope, uh, Eric, I hope that this is the start of something. You know, I really hope that this is the beginning of changing people's uh, minds. And even those that think, you know, I don't see color, I'm, we're all good, let's just move on. 
you have to stop a bit and look around. And are you, are you sure that everything you're doing doesn't have a hidden message? Because I didn't see the hidden messages in little things I did. And so I think we all have uh, a, you know, a role to play here. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Reed is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Equinox Hotels uh, with an extensive career as well, including leadership roles in world-class brands such as Langham Hospitality Group, Morgan Hotel Group, and others. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining us uh, from New York. Uh, I'd love, I know you have a question for uh, Jean-Luc Larré, so please, the mic is yours. Um, and it's an honor just to be, you know, I, I coming from Equinox, uh, I feel very lucky, very fortunate to work for a brand, you know, that's, that's really embraces diversity, unlike a lot of others. Uh, and as a member of the LGBTQ community, you know, I feel that I can, I can be my authentic self here. Um, and Equinox really did that by pushing a lot of uh, social progress through marketing, uh, pushing the envelope through communication and, and core values of embracing diversity. Um, and as we create Equinox Hotels as a brand now, um, you know, it, for me, it, travel is all about diversity. You know, anyone with a passion for travel must be or should be <laughs> open to discovering and understanding new cultures, uh, people, beliefs. Uh, but yet it's, it's so challenging for 99% of our industry as, as we're talking about here. Um, so I guess it's how do we continue really to take this momentum to the next level to bring together top companies and and form almost like a, a coalition of best practices. Uh, almost, I, I joke that it's a manual of sorts that you can really uh, implement across various brands and countries. It's a long-winded question, but... <laughs> Jean-Luc. Right. <clears throat> um, let me tell you. It's interesting because we talk about colorblind and uh, I'm the one who say in a little meeting we had before that I was colorblind because diversity for me is not an option. It was a choice, uh, a choice by the fact that I travel. When I was young, I was lucky enough to, to move to Bora Bora to live in beautiful places, Barbados, Bahamas and everything. And my job, I didn't realize at the time, but yes, I was a lucky guy who came to manage his property. And my ambition at that, at that time was, of course, to manage the best of the property, but at the same time to recognize the diversity and the cultural uh, of the country there. What was interesting is, for me, my goal was when I leave, I would be able to put in place a local team who's going to be taking over for me. And that was really my ambition. That was my goal. And I managed that in most of the property I run. Uh, in Barbados, in Bahamas, he's a Bahamian running after when I left, uh, the one and only. I mean, it was really in each of these countries, it was my goal. Because for me, it was colorblinded. It was not about the, the color of the people. It was about the local community to help them to grow. And it was the same as Alexandra trying to go to the school and find and give a passion to the hotel industry. Even when I went in Kabul, Afghanistan, we make an hotel and we really wanted the the people from Afghanistan to run this hotel, which became a leading hotel, by the way. So it was interesting. That was my ambition. But I realized, talking today, that it was not enough. It was definitely not enough because I was colorblind. It was easy for me. I was coming as a white boss, uh, trying to look good and uh, making sure that, you know, the local will become the next level of managers and become the next level of this industry. And that's what I did. But I never realized how difficult it is for someone which is not white to really be accepted. And when I say I was colorblind because I couldn't see that because the differentiation of the racial, you know, and the different religion we had was like a melting pot. And in this industry, as a general manager, I was more into the learning experience, trying to teach them, not by races, not trying to say, you have to welcome these guests, but you have to welcome by the country of origin. You have to respect their religion, but never look at the color of the skin. I never understood at that time that it could be really affecting some of some other people. Because as you say, when you're flipping through the magazine, if you don't feel you're going to be welcome in this hotel. So in my collaterals, in everything I've done, I've done exactly the same like everybody else. So now with GLN and Co, you know, I'm creative mind. That's what we do. And uh, the objective is really to help investors around the world or connecting people and creative ideas. 
And, uh, you know, creative ideas, I realized that it's always interesting how we welcome these guests in a different way. I was trying to look at the way, you know, he's walking out from the, um, from the car into the lobby and trying to say, well, this is a, is a D, is a I, is a S, is a C. I mean, that's all different code. But saying this is how you need to attend to him. His objective is to get his room. How are you going to do it? Just tell his room is ready and we're going to show him straight away. So that was really my thing. I think now I will definitely going to recognize that it was maybe not the right uh, choice. And we have to recognize as well the fact that the different color of the people around here have different expectations because they come from different backgrounds. And I think that's very important to understand where they're where they are coming from. And, you know, I heard someone was saying that his, his proudest moment was the fact that his daughter um, was his proudest thing in his life and the proudest achievement. I think that was my private achievement because I traveled for, and I live in, um, I see more than 122 countries. What is interesting is my daughters decided, my twin decided to do the same. And you know where they're working now? After traveling around the world, they're in the United Nations and they only want to help people around the world. So they went to teach people in Tibet, English, they went to Africa, they went everywhere. And now the only thing their job is United Nations based in Geneva to try to help everyone around the world. So that was a good achievement. My, now my own achievement needs to recognize in the system industry, we need to help and make sure that people understand. And we've been color blinded, but I think we've been, color, we've been blindfolded because that was the wrong, wrong things to say. And I think I understand now that we have to be more careful and understand where the people are coming from and how could we help them. And it's definitely diversity. It's embracing different culture, different religion. But at the same time, it's, an, it's not an option. It should be a choice. And it should be a choice done by every single one of us. Yeah, no, it's very, very well said. And, and I think it's nice to see, you know, if you can recognize that I did it wrong and I want to make a difference tomorrow, that's great. And Chris, it's, uh, you know, it's great to hear about the incredible success and the benchmark that Equinox is and that you feel so at home there. And so I'm excited because I know you're going to be part of our committee and you're going to be one of the, the, the forces behind it uh, so we can learn from it, you know, and the language they use and the imaging they use. So a lot of the times companies don't do it, not because they don't want to, but they don't know how. Um, and so this manual will be the Bible. It's like the gold mine, because if it existed, I would have read it already 50 million times, you know, but there isn't one. And it makes it makes walking this path so scary, you know, so and I think it stops people from talking about it. So if we can put together a little manual, uh, I thought I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are hungry to read it. So thank you for your help and your commitment to, to the subject. I really appreciate it. Um, the next question is uh, for the, the Nilu. Um, Danilo, you describe yourself as very passionate about people. And I can add that you have a phenomenal positive approach to life. Uh, I've seen you around the world and it doesn't matter the situation or the challenge that we're facing, you always manage to turn it around and make it a light and fun matter. Um, and so I would love for you to tell, you, tell us a little bit briefly about your journey until you reached today and you know, how all of this helped you. Wait, you're on mute as well. There you go. Hi, uh, thank you, Tina, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to share uh, this conversation. Uh, and, and I think you were very brave to put this white elephant that was in the room right here. But at the same time, uh, we are having a such productive and constructive approach for the subject that we're making it way lighter than what it was <laughs> It really is. So I'm very part, I'm very proud to be part of all of that. Um, I was born in Brazil and in Salvador, which is considered the most black city outside of Africa. And I lived there for until I was 20, 22. And uh, being part of a community where everyone is black, uh, I realized that the, the, the prejudice was not only for being black, but also for being poor. So I had two problems to solve in my life, okay? So uh, fortunately, I decided to come to Europe, to Portugal for the university. And once I got here, I remind about the book that I read from one of my uh, teachers of uh, Federal University in Brazil. And one of the paragraphs, he was saying that, hey, no, uh, he was, uh, just for mention, he was a black guy who have uh, PhD in geography in the 60s in Brazil. Uh, so that was a real achievement. And he was saying, um, there's no problem 
on people do not like uh, not like uh, you. I mean, you don't have to like everyone, to love everyone. You have to obligation to respect everyone. Okay. So as long as you do not imply any uh, restriction in terms of political, economical, or social terms, you as long as respect the other, you don't have to love every human being uh, around yourself. Although that's what we wanted, but we know that technically or uh, basically that's not true. So having that in mind, when I got here in Portugal, I just realized that first, I was in one of the most tolerant country anyone can ever be. It doesn't matter if you're part of the black community, LGBTQI, uh, Muslim, I mean, it doesn't matter. People are just used to welcome. Portugal went to uh, discover the world in the 15th century, and they went to India, to Africa, to America. So this is a melting pot. People are used to uh, deal with um, different people uh, for five centuries. So this was a very, um, very good point. But at the same time, there was still a stereotype that people used to put on me always when they see me. Okay, Brazilian, young guy, come over here, so what's going on? I realized that if I could overcome this little um, step that they put, things were wide open. And once I realized that, things became way more easy. So uh, it, it was for me an uh, extremely positive experience and I did love to come to Portugal because it gave me uh, way more confident about who I was and I'm pretty sure that what I did as a professional was also uh, because of the environment that I faced in here. So I knew that in any situation I have to overcome that first label that people put on me but once that was done, it was my responsibility and only that to go forward or not. So I think that bringing this conversation to the table is, is, is as important as we really realize that this is not a black community issue. Uh, this is a, a, a everyone's issue. And once we talk and we, uh, once we, we spread our ideas, we could come up with real solutions, and that's what really makes it change. If we have uh, uh, only an African-American border here, we would keep the conversation within the community. And what we want right now is to spread it to the world, because that's when change really happens. So I'm very happy to be part of, the, of this talk, and thank you for promoting that. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Danilo. Um, I commend you amazing accomplishments. Um, the next question is for Alexandra. It's from um, Brianna Glenn. Brianna is a travel advisor, owner of Milk Honey Travels, um, also a, associated to Virtuoso, uh, Virtuoso Agency. Um, passionate about travel and about helping people. She started exploring the globe as a professional track and field athlete and covered over 30 countries in 10 years. Um, Brianna, thank you so much for, for joining us. I think it's, again, thank you for all your insights, for sharing with me and helping me put all this together. Um, I know you have a question for Alexander, so please go ahead. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for um, having me be a part of this. So hi, Alexander. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to ask my question specifically to you, especially because your company is based in the US. And as we know, this issue of diversity and racial inequality has taken a center stage in our country and then also is affecting the world at large, I think in a way that it needs to. But um, there are plenty of people in this country specifically that are doing a lot of personal work as they listen and educate themselves, which is definitely the necessary place to start. And I think we've spoken today about representation. And I believe it is such an important topic that we all need to continue to take a hard look at within our own sphere of influence. Um, I think that when there are diverse and unique voices at the table, specifically at tables of power, decisions are made that reflect all of us and we are better for it. And I think Ted eloquently shared that. So thank you, Ted. So my question for you is this, as a business owner of a successful travel company who has an obvious sphere of influence, are there any new conversations that you brought to the table for discussions on what you see needs to change in the future or what action steps you've identified that will help you achieve them? as you understand more about what is lacking in America specifically. And I do want to acknowledge what Tina brought up that there is something you are obviously doing well already. Um, and that is a natural byproduct of your leadership. 
and maybe because you were not born in America. <laughs> um, but I believe many business owners and specifically in travel are saying, okay, I believe change needs to happen. I'm just not sure what to do or where to start. So I'm just wondering if maybe you have some tangible examples. No, in fact, I was born in North Africa, which is in Tunisia. And uh, I grew up in France. Uh, so I have learned from a little bit of all, all world. Um, but, you know, I, Again, as I think we are doing the right thing in our company, um, you know, we have a flat organization um, in our company and, uh, and it's an open door policy, which means that anyone uh, from any level of the company can go to whoever they want. Uh, but even if we do that, I think we all have to learn and we're learning every day. And uh, we have to expand in what we are doing and trying to do more. And, uh, you know, as it's, it's funny as a, I, I don't know if it's funny, but um, <laughs> something that was not done before was been done for my company today and also was done with my sister company, Travel Leaders, uh, for the uh, Juneteenth day. Uh, we have given the half of the day off uh, to anyone who wants to take it. You, you know, you will not have think of something like this happening yesterday. Um, I, I see that as progress. I see that that you know things moving in the right direction, and 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 that's what I'm saying. It's it's really learning every day, and and keeping your eyes and your ears open to problem that we are facing all of us, and and making sure that we just don't talk about it, but we do something about it. Uh, talk it's easy. Doing it is a little more difficult than people will have to work a little harder to prove that this is exactly what they mean when they talk about it. Again, very, I don't know very... if my answer was right or not, but. Brianna, do you want to add anything or was that, did, did that do the trick? No, I mean, I think that I, ho I hope that if there are other. Um, business owners or, you know, agency owners out there who are wondering kind of, you know, how do I, number one, attract um, different people of color to feel like, because I know for myself, I started in this industry before 2016, but I couldn't find where to get my foot in the door. And that's kind of why that what made my push to be like, okay, I'll just go the um, independent route. And entrepreneurship suits me, so that's great. But I think that there are a lot of people who, number one, they don't see themselves, but they also don't know how to get their foot in the door. So I'm thankful that your company does that. And I want more companies to learn how to do that um, because at all levels, we need to see more representation. Um, but I think that it just adds to the beauty of the industry when you know diversity is, is a thing. So I hope that if even other you know, agency owners talk to you even, you know, I think a good conversation can go a long way to see what you're doing and how they can be different. But you know, Bianca, yeah, I, I mean, up to you. I mean, it, it's fabulous that you have created your own company. I shall pull my hat off to you. And, and what I have seen, it's a great company too. Uh, but we also have the other side of it, which are independent contractor. And that, if you wanted to see for people to start a business, this would be the best way for them to start because they have absolutely no risk and doesn't matter which area you come from and doesn't matter which race you're from or which religion you are from. You can walk in our door, decide to be an independent contractor and that the entrepreneurship. And if you are successful, like many of the people we have today and we have 450 uh, independent contractor and a lot of diversity, if you know, if you see that you are successful, then you can move on and open your own companies the way you did it so successfully. I mean, so opportunity are there. People are just have to walk in and they be open, uh, they be received with open now. I love that energy. Um, and and uh, talking about energy, um, Ted, I wanted, I, I've heard you speak about diversity with so much passion, which I admire so, so fondly and so fond of. Um, you were born in Shanghai, you grew up in Hong Kong um, until the age of 13, and then you moved to the US. Um, there is a growing concern right now, and I speak to my friends in Asia about a, uh, an up and coming growth in racism. And I say growth because I know it's already there but uh, really connected to the origin of the coronavirus. Um, and and I, I genuinely ask this question out of concern because 
if we if we have a feeling that this this bad energy is coming, you know, what do we do now to stop it or to prevent it or to reduce it? Or because it's it's another subject that is is scary. You know, Asians right now are scared to travel to the U.S. and to many other countries because of the level of um, racism. And I'd love to hear from you. What do we do? Keep forgetting there you to go. Un 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 unmute myself. Um, th 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 thanks for that. Um, you know, uh, there, there, there'll be people who may be ignorant and, and discriminate, but you know, the virus does not discriminate at all. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at most of the audience on, on this uh, webinar is from the US, uh, Canada or, or, or Brazil and you know, US and Brazil are the two hardest hit countries uh, with this virus. You know, when it comes to infections and deaths, it, it doesn't really matter, or at least it really matters less the origin of the virus, but more about the competence or incompetence of the politicians and, and, and the people who are selfish and reckless who won't wear masks and, 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 and keep distances. So if you take this, topic beyond just the virus, right? You know, um, as, a, as an industry, as a travel tourism industry, right? It's, it's everybody's business. It's not just those of us who work in it. You know, I mean, it, it takes a village to make people feel welcome. Welcome as people rather than welcome your money, right? And, and we can do so much to express our our sense of genuine hospitality through our unique culture. And, you know, that's all good. Yet the little things can destroy a, a, the reputation of a, of, a, of, a, of a culture. I think of, you know, Italian football fans throwing bananas onto the field when there are black players on the other team. That doesn't represent the Italian hospitality that I know or the, or the Spanish basketball team uh, taking a group photo, posing for a group photo with the slant eyes, you know, gesture in the in the 2008 Olympics, and and these things are not just offensive to who they offend, whether it be blacks in, in Italy or not, but they offend other people too, and they may choose not to come to a destination because if you all behave this way towards blacks, how would you behave towards me? You know, I mean, I know Italians who find that offensive, right? Um, in, in, in travel, we, we often like to quote Mark Twain's, travel is fatal to prejudice and bigotry and narrow-mindedness. Well, that's, that's very true, unless you're on the receiving end of that prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness when you travel. So it is a privilege that gave Mark Twain that perspective, right? But what if we truly, truly make it a mission to embrace and enlighten all those who travel? Right? What, what, what if we are all making contacts and, and, and take it upon ourselves that it's everybody's business to welcome visitors so we can indeed break down those barriers? Um, so, you know, whether it's, whether it's the COVID-19 or whatever issue is, the the, the culture of any place, and it takes upon you know the, the government to really think about it and to so how they project themselves. And, and I think the global nature of this, um, the protests about injustice and, 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 and police brutality and, and all of this prejudice and all is bringing up an awareness, right? What brings out the best in people are not these limiting activities, but it's, it's, it's really love. I believe people, human beings, we take actions out of love or fear, and they both produce results. But fear has a cost and it's very limiting, and love is expanding, it's unlimited. You know, let's, let's, let's take actions out of love for each other rather than out of fear. Beautifully, beautifully put. Um, I hope that your message is heard um, beyond and beyond. And I wanted to ask Nancy, I think um, 
here on this panel, and and it's not only it's it's the guests that are here, it's the, the panelists, it's everybody here. There's so much wisdom and so much knowledge, and I think that especially Nancy, with you through the through the media, through your years at Travel and Leisure, uh, you've seen hard times. You you know the barriers. Um, the idea of having a mentorship program where you can possibly take a few young journalists under your wings and show them the way and help maybe open a few doors, you know, once you see their talents. And Ted, with all his experience, do you think there is a, um, if there is an opportunity there? Do you think this is something that would work? Because one of the big challenges is to say, we all have to do something, but then you go back and you go, I don't know what to do. So I'll just go back to doing what I know what to do, which is my job, you know, and then boom, this conversation goes nowhere. So my challenge is, would we be willing, and all of us on this panel, I think Chris could be a mentor, you know, everybody could be a mentor, Eric could be a mentor, I could be a mentor. Do you think that this is doable in the media world to start um, as a movement, uh, genuinely, or do you see barriers of entry even, because there are barriers? I think that's a great idea, actually, Tina, and I think that kind of one-on-one -on -one advising and, and directing can be a great opportunity for change, for advancement. Um, I, and I think it happens, it needs to happen across all areas of the hospitality industry. Um, and just to make sure that people of talent get the opportunities they need. And to, I, I think what we're all now more sensitive to than ever is the, the power of the challenges people face who are not white. Um, and maybe particularly, at least in the United States, if they are black um, because of the lack of role models, the lack of representation within the hotels, within hotels, within, you know, magazines, in photos. And I, I think that the way to turn it around may be with some big steps and some very tiny steps of the, which I would put mentoring as a representation of. And um, I personally would love to do that, though I'm not a an editor any longer. I'm, <laughs> you know, selling travel. But um, yeah, I think that that's, that's a great way to affect change. No, that's, that's amazing. And the fact that you're not an editor doesn't change the fact that you are, have immense wisdom. And there's, I mean, infinite number of people that would love to have access to your mentorship. So I have that's miles on me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and in the same note, Danilo, um, if you were speaking today to a young, um, you know, a, a young person that wants to get into travel or even not within the travel to be an entrepreneur, um, but is from a minority community and it doesn't have to be the black community, it could be a different community. Um, what, you know, what tips or what, what would be your advice? Okay. Uh, first, uh, realize that, um, you're going to be. You, the, the, um, the starting running for you is a little bit backwards. Okay, so you're gonna have to run faster, gonna have to make it better, gonna have to smile a lot, and gonna have to work way harder uh, to get um, to the starting line where the other are. And then once we're there, you're gonna be on the same game, on the same game, and you're gonna still have to prove that you deserve to be on that position. So uh, even getting over here is a challenge. Okay, and you're gonna have to face that. You wanna you just you don't just show up and say, Hey, I'm the luxury I'm in the luxury business travel. You're gonna have to struggle a lot, um, and normally you struggle a little bit harder, uh, because you're gonna have to break a lot of barriers people will put from you for innumerable reasons. Um, and you can't let these things put you down. You just have to uh, believe in yourself and prove that they are wrong. Uh, and once they see they are wrong, probably uh, they're going to start to see you as the same. And then you're going to still have to prove that you're better to get your business. <laughs> it's a hard path ahead. Uh, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But I, I appreciate that it takes a little, takes harder work, um, you know, if, if you're not white. And that's 
something we struggle with. Um, and I hope that this panel is bringing some light and that we can make a movement. And before we go, I always like, and I'm gonna ask this question to everybody, okay? Um, if everybody were to forget everything that was said on this panel, that would be a shame because there's tremendous wisdom here. But if that were to happen, and you wanted to leave one message, and it's one message to anyone you want to leave. You can leave a message to your community. You can leave a message to the global audience. You can leave a message to anyone. What message do you want to leave after everybody that's tuned in to this very exciting and, you know, I think we're, we're starting something great here, but what message would you like to leave? And maybe, uh, Janelle, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I would say first is acknowledgement and then it's action. So I think that that's key for, for any movement, but I think right now it's, it's simply not ignoring or the people that had hesitation to you hosting this particular uh, topic um, as, you know, as sensitive as it can be. It's about acknowledging um, the own, your own uh, maybe inefficiencies, uh, put it on paper, you know, get the statistics and, you know, show how many black people you have on your team, how many people of color or Latinos LGBTQ, break it down so that you can be as transparent as possible with your community and your audience, and then act on it. Create a smart plan to be able to create a measurable um, plan that will be able to activate not only your company, but your followers and the people who um, are holding you accountable. Fantastic message and learn, be open to learning. I learned so much from all of you um, and thank you. And I think that you can always do better. We can always, you know, correct and, and there's, there's always progress uh, to be done. Um, Jean-Luc, what's, what's your message? What do you want people to remember from? Well, the message is very clear. I mean, uh, you know, you talk about the white elephant, interesting, white elephant, <laughs> maybe another color we should choose. But what is interesting is I think you say exactly right. We have to recognize and we have to learn. And um, and the first thing when you go and you meet with a new culture, wherever you are in the world, it's you try to learn from them and understand where they're coming from and everything. And I think that's the reason we have two ears and one mouth, obviously, because we have to listen twice as we speak. Uh, it was very interesting to listen to all the others during this uh, panel, the preparation and now, because I learned a lot, uh, obviously. And I learned a lot of things that I was maybe doing wrong, not because obviously I was falling on the wrong category, but because I really thought I was colorblinded. And uh, it's easy to be colorblinded, right? It's not easy to be colorblinded if you're you know, from another gender, religion, or, or color. So I, I actually is going to reassign my view and definitely going to help with my company Creative Mind, making sure the change is going to happen in quite a few boards meeting around the world. Ah, that's very nice. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jean-Luc. Uh, Chris, tell us what message you want to leave. Oh, well, thank you again. Uh, honestly, for me, I, like many others probably on this call, uh, have been so, have been too quiet, I think, for too long, where, you know, we listen and reflect, but we don't want to ruffle feathers. Uh, and really, you know, cause any rifts. And so for me, you know, hearing from such inspirational leaders like all of you on this panel um, is amazing. And I think the more that we spread this um, throughout our industry, you know, and start being vocal, even with just small change, um, really good things are going to happen. And I know it's very incremental and it's gonna take a lot of time, but, you know, um, I'm, appreciative to all of you and to everyone that's that's um, that's dialed in for this webinar and I think there's a lot that we have to do uh, but you know Tina you've really inspired me to help really put this this plan of action together and make it something that we can um, emulate across the brands so I appreciate thank you no, thank, thank you. Um, it's very exciting. And one of the things that I realized is that we have benchmarks, you know, where there's a lot to learn. There's many companies that are not doing it right. I think the desire is there even for those that are not doing it right. But there's also companies that are already ahead, you know, um, and, and those 
that have acknowledged it perfectly. I was talking about uh, last week, we had Alinho Azevedo from um, the Little Nell Hotel Company and uh, Aspen Ski Company came out with a very strong statement. You know, we're committed, we are at fault. They said, we are not an example. We are at fault as a mountain, as a destination, as a hotel, and we're committed to change that. And it was a very vocal message, very strong message. And when he was on the panel, I said, so what are you going to do about it? And he said, this, this, this. And I said, great. So wait, if you're working on all these amazing initiatives from hiring and recruitment and communication and imaging, why don't we join with Equinox and other companies and get Ted and Jean-Luc and Alexander and all of us here and Nancy with a vision of, and just to have a talk every other month to say, hey, who did you talk to? How far did our message go? You know, Eric, well, how can we help and keep teaching us, keep opening our minds. And so that's my dream after, you know, all this, that's my desire. Um, Alexander, tell us your message. Yeah, talking about dream, I hope that uh, this become a reality and that, and that everything we have talked today about uh, become a reality. And, um, you know, and basically, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult for me, but I wish that everyone think like us and like me and I mean equality and all be part of the same family of the same team and all working together. There is nothing very difficult about that. I mean, it, it could be realized, just need smart people ready to move on with life. And that will be what I would like people to think about. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to go back. We had, and I'm sorry, I keep remembering these amazing speakers we've had. We had uh, Toby Smith, which is the deputy chairman of Swire last week, and we were talking about sustainability. And one of the things that um, he said, which was so brilliantly and simply put, was that there is no ROI to sustainability. He said very simply, you do it because it's the right thing to do, and we don't look at the ROI. And this is the same reason to do this because it's the right thing to do and every other thing would be awful, you know? It, it, it is awful and, you know, we can't stand for it. We have to change. And so um, I agree with what you're saying, Alexander. I wish it was that simple that if all of us would think at, at least within this panel, it would life would be so much easier. Um, uh, Brianna, tell us a little bit about your, your final message. Um, yeah, I think my final message, I would say I'm um, encouraged by um, you know, both yourself, Tina and Jean-Luc with the kind of like light bulb moments that you've had um, in our discussions, that's very encouraging to me. Um, and it's, it's, it's encouraging because when representation matters in a way that you can understand when you, when you think of it from the opposite way and, and you haven't seen something, somebody do something that you're aspiring to, right? Which is what we, we struggle with so often. And, um, when I saw those light bulbs, that is encouraging to me because I think that marketing and representation and all of those things have the opportunity to either show us what is or what we hope it to be. And so when it's not quite what we want it to be, we can do the work to change it, to change the message of who this is for, who we want to attract and who matters. And that's kind of like the point of getting to all lives matter is to really, really highlight what who's not mattering in, in the right way right now. So. I think it's just been encouraging to see those light bulb moments and it's nice to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so important. Danilo, what's your message? Okay, so um, since I was quite young, like teenager, I realized that I want to do two things in my life. One is uh, make things happen no matter what. And second, make a real difference on people around me. I could dream about changing the world, but I really want to make a real, real difference on people who work around me. And to do that, I really believe that we have to be extremely positive. Everyone faces challenges. Everyone has difficult times. It is not for the racism, it is for a uh, healthy or money issue. But if ultimately you can change the situation, change the way you look at that. But the most important is not losing your goal and keeping going, keeping moving forward. So uh, it's an optimistic message that I think that uh, is the most important thing is keep optimistic and making this change and uh, real change uh, around you. Very important message and keeping an open mind. You know, I think it's sec accepting to change your point of view is, is a very difficult thing to do. And it's a very important quality to, to, to hold close. Nancy, um, tell us about your message. 
or your insight? Well, I think this has been a very interesting uh, opportunity to me, for me to really look at how little I've seen, you know, how the, my own maybe lack of sensitivity, despite noticing, you know, that there weren't enough people of color, particularly blacks and, but, you know, I think that it is a moment where I feel that I need to do what I can. Um, and I'm still, I'm still really disappointed and puzzled that it has gone on so long, but also grateful for having this opportunity, you know, is kind of wrenching as many aspects of uh, Black Lives Matter has been uh, as, you know, painful all around. I think that it is, you know, we're coming out of this, we are emerging, or I don't know if we'll ever fully emerge, but there's an action plan that needs to be put in motion for people in all industries and in all, you know, their private lives and to be really thoughtful and to to contribute to change. Very much, very much so. And I, I wanna just share a quick story. I, we've been doing masterclasses and uh, at the end of the masterclasses of communication, the, 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 um, the speaker, which his name is Jeff Chatterton, he's a specialist, fantastic man on, a specialist on crisis communication. And it was interesting. We had at the end, we, we do mentorship programs. So we have agents come in and there was this agent that came in and she was so passionate about starting a work towards helping diversity. And she says, I want to help. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to leave travel and I just want to help and make sure that I can communicate things because at the end of the day, all lives matter, you know? And, and I, she was so passionate about helping. And I told her, I said, right now, do you realize the message you're sending? I know your intention is fantastic, but you know what message you're sending? She says, no, I want to help everybody. And so a friend of mine told me this story and it helped me so much. And I know that it's helped other people understand. And for her, she had an aha moment. And I said, I told her, I said, oh, her name is Alana. And I said, imagine if these, there's a, a, a neighborhood and there's a building that's on fire. And this building is asked, screaming for help for it because it's burning. And it's saying, my life matters. And all the buildings around says, hey, our lives matter too. All lives matter, right? And the building that's on fire says, I realize that but I'm on fire, like, you know, and so I told her, I said, if you turn to the burning building and say, all lives matter, how do you think it feels, you know? And suddenly she looked at me, she said, oh my goodness, you know, she had that same aha moment that I had with Janelle and the, with Brianna and with Chris and in a very different way. And she said, that's not what I want to say. And I said, well, see, that's that close to, to provoking, you no, know, the wrong message. So this aha moments are, if we can, you know, get these messages across and though many people with good intentions could provoke the wrong message, not by any, you know, bad intention, but just by these very important um, subtle messages. Um, and when you talk about messages, Eric Floyd, you're very good and eloquent. And I love to hear what you have to say and leave us with a strong message. Yeah. It's been a you know, very interesting time with everything going on in the world. Um, I've had so many colleagues and me, old friends reach out to me personally. I mean, I share the same last name as George Floyd, and I'm Eric Floyd, and I, I don't want to be a hashtag. Um, but I mean, for me, I've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations. Um, friends, you know, who are white, reached out to me and would say, I mean, crying, um, just saying, you know, I don't believe I haven't asked you what it felt like to be black in all the years that I've known you things like that. So I, I think it's important for all of us to have the uncomfortable conversations, um, step outside of our bubbles, um, talk to other people that are not like us and um, have, you know, just really have those conversations and that's the only way that change will happen. Very much so. And um, I think I've asked everybody but Ted and I know Ted has always these very, very strong messages. So I wanted to leave you to the end, Ted, no pressure but your wisdom, you know, so I'm leaving you to the end to end with a punch in the best way form possible that that is. Uh, you, <laughs> you have the mic. Bring it on home. All right. 
<laughs> Most of us live life in a pattern of have, do, be. If I have this, I can do that, and I'll be this. A more powerful way to live life is be, do, have. Choose who we want to be. Take actions based on that being, and we'll have the results. Right? For organizations, it takes leadership and commitment. I've laid out three kinds of company: defensive, green, or strategic advantage. Choose who you want to be as an organization. For individuals, it takes personal accountability. Do you want to be a racist? Do you want to be a non-racist? Do you want to be an anti-racist? Or do you want to be active, inclusive? Choose. Choose who you want to be and take actions from there. Tina, thank you for a wonderful opportunity to share some thoughts, and and delighted to see this conversation as a as a springboard, as a starting point of even greater things to come. Thank you all so much. I end my week feeling like tomorrow is going to be a different day for all of us.、Uh, we have so much work to do. I'm sorry, but I will be calling upon all of you,、uh, and I hope that you know we together can can take this message further. So thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to be on and for you know talking about this slightly being uncomfortable, which that's what I guess we have to be okay with being uncomfortable、uh, in order to reach comfort. So. Thank you. Have a great weekend and kisses, virtual hug, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you.